Any questions? Ah, uh, she's well, let's see. Oh, yeah, we, we, we haven't had a class since the last test. So there could be questions. Are there? Yeah? Tell me the class. We did. Remember, we're, yes. we were talking about uh, statically indeterminate problems. Uh, nobody corrected the spelling on the board, so you can go back to the video and see if you can catch it. You can catch it until I looked at the video, but that's what we were looking at. We're looking at the, those questions where uh, the static equilibrium is, in the fish, is, is incomplete in terms of uh, solving our problems. As I, uh, as I told you all last fall, this, all the statics we were doing last fall was to lead to uh, stuff we needed to do here to, to uh, it was uh, very much a part of what we're going to do here. Uh, typically in our two-dimensional problems, this is three equations. And most of our problems are such. For a full three-dimensional problems, that's a full six equations then. But for most of what we're doing is three equations. Um, so uh, statically indeterminate problems are those that have more than three unknowns. Because, usually because there are more supports than are necessary. Um, the simple example that uh, we've looked at before is that type of problem where that that uh, that beam is has more reactions than we could solve for with the three equations. Another one, and we'll look at it now, is the type of problem where we have uh, some kind of support structure between rigid, immovable supports. Remember, that's that's what we take this type of thing to be. So if we load this somewhere with some load, this to us is statically indeterminate because we can uh, certainly draw a free body diagram of it where maybe this is the reaction down at uh, one end, this is the reaction at the other due to the presence of that load. We can't solve that with our statics equations. Uh, in fact, the only equation we can come up with is that uh, at least as drawn, we can't do any more than that statically. So we still have to satisfy static equilibrium, but we also have to come up with some other things that will help us help us solve that problem. Oh, by the way, any I didn't see any questions over the weekend on the take home, so is that going okay? Or you started it? No, absolutely not. It's five o'clock, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 values tending to sixth, but that the third. Uh, well, I didn't. I didn't. I just said it was steel and aluminum. I didn't say what kind. So, uh, I double checked, you know, make sure because I hate, hate when there's typos. So that uh, those those values use those values as there. <coughs> yep. I don't know if you asked this or not. Jake, you say that every story, time. Story you have a question. <laughs> story of my life. Is that that? Okay, no, that makes it easy. All right, so so uh, uh, the way this simple types of problem work, well, you probably already have an idea how we do this one. Same same picture, just moved over a little bit, so I have a little room.
and we'll, uh, we'll even allow the possibility that the load is not necessarily centered. The uh, guiding or overriding equations, of course, are the static equilibrium ones we just showed in whatever form they might be, that the reactions must equal the load, and that the total deformation of the material, remember that's the, uh, that's the new thing we brought in this term that we didn't have all the other all through fall is the fact that these materials are elastic in nature and tended to form. This allows us the extra equation we need and we can then solve it. What should the deformation be for a problem like this one? with here what's for this type of problem this type of, of structure you know and this this could be a a uh, a building structure with uh, a floor right here that's loaded and then we look at it as this type of thing the total deformation allowable in this support structure is Is what? Yeah. Well, even more specific than that. Huh? Yeah. These are both rigid and immovable. Therefore, the total deformation must be zero. Be a little bit of stretch there a little bit of compression there because of the type of force that I've shown there, but total allowable between two rigid supports is zero. And then that allows us to finish the problem since uh, we'll have two deformations. There'll be some load in the first one Typically, we take these to have the same material. And then we'll have the same type of thing in the uh, second one. This drawing looks like they're in the same area, so it makes the two of those very straightforward in terms of, of how to solve those. Well, we've already looked at that type of thing, the, the using the constraints on the deformation itself as our extra equation. So we'll look at a new, another way to do this, another possibility for this type of problem to be solved, and that's called superposition. Superposition is those times when we take two solutions, neither one of which completely solves the problem, lay them over each other, superimpose them on each other, and the two solutions that were incomplete individually give us a complete solution uh, themselves. So we'll, uh, we'll do this within the structure of a problem, very much like the ones we've seen before some kind of some kind of structural support of, of uh, various means different areas I'll take that to be 150 millimeters so is the bottom 
but midway through we put uh, a load, so I've got to split that in half. So midway through we have a change in area. Midway through the lower part we'll have a a load. Actually, we do in the upper part too. No, wait a second here. Oh, wait, wait. I'm sorry. The drawing is different. That's why you should take notes in chalk. Four equal sections, all 150 millimeters. That's what I meant to draw. So, 150 at each of these. Well, take your notes and pen. You can take notes and chalk. It's easy to fix. All right. So each of these midpoints, we have a load. That looks a little better. Three hundred kilonewtons there. Six hundred kilonewtons there. And an area change from 250 to 400. Square millimeters. All right, there's our picture. Now that we've got it straight. This is statically indeterminate because of the two rigid supports on either side. There's no way using our static equilibrium that we can find what the reactions are. Find the reactions. There's two. There's one at the upper uh, part and one at the lower part. We've got to find the two. So the superposition we're going to use is like this. We're going to uh, take this to be the equivalent of two separate problems. What we'll do first is uh, imagine that the bottom end is free and subject to a force there. With the two loads being imposed. Now, uh, hopefully you recognize me, it's still statically indeterminate, but it allows us to make the first step in terms of the, uh, the solution we want to find. So, what we'll do... Again, the free end, free of this support, but free of the reaction as well. So we'll just look at the two loads on this piece. That will cause it to deform some amount we'll call del L. I don't know why I called it del L, but we will. That's an incomplete solution, of course, because it's missing this reaction that would keep it from deforming. 
but it's a partial solution that we can solve. That we can solve, we could have solved that weeks ago when we first learned about strain. We're going to add to it with our magic plus sign of superposition another partial solution that we can complete and the two together will give us this reaction and be equivalent to the original statically indeterminate solution we were looking for. This time we imagine Given this greater length, what force would be required to return it to its original length? Obviously, del L plus del R equals zero. So that they cancel each other out. When we add those two together, we've got the two loads. We've got no change in length of the strut. And we've got the reaction force in there. And so we do have this solution. With two partial solutions, that we can manage. That's superposition. This, this is the superposition move right here that gives us a solution that we couldn't have found normally. All right, so let's work out the details. We got some numbers here. So first thing we're going to have to find is what is this in the first part of the solution, and then what is that in the second part of the solution. All right, let's see. This is a problem we've done before. got an actually axially loaded material and because of the area changes and by the way we're assuming this is all one material but there's two different loads two different areas which breaks this whole thing into four pieces Remember, any time there's a change in load or a change in area, we need to reconsider that as a subpiece to figure out what are the loads in each of the subsections. Remember, we're doing this this middle middle solution right now. All right, so we can figure out this, the loads in the different sections by making imaginary cuts through the material. For example, there's a cut through section 4 with no loads on it. So we know that in this bottom section there's neither tension nor compression. It's unloaded. Remember we're doing this second solution here that we can do with the reaction force from the bottom removed. Then we go up, make an imaginary cut through section three. We 
we know that at this midpoint, there's a downward force. What was it? 600 kilonewtons? Is that the one there? I moved it down just because that allows me to expose the interior force and force in the material itself. And we can tell that section three then is in a load of uh, Six hundred kilonewtons. So you take a second, figure out the load in sections two and in one. Please. There's the restraining order. Sure. Let me know how it goes. It's always good news when I learn I get rid of another student. Um, nobody in here is graduating this year, right? Nobody's going to RPI in the fall, or a couple of you guys are going back to Clarkson, maybe. All right. Yeah, I guess we're not going to award a single one of the scholarships this year. Good, I don't have to go to the awards anymore yet. Thanks. It's too bad if you guys are going to Clarkson fresh. I can give you a $10,000 scholarship. Even if you weren't any good, one year we didn't have anybody we thought was any good, they called on us and all of a sudden said, give it to them anyway. <laughs> Somebody's got to have it. Okay. All right, you're looking for the other pieces by making, again, imaginary cuts through the material with the loads as imposed. there. P2, 600 kilonewtons, obviously, I hope, it's obvious. It's dangerous when, when, when we say that sometimes, but that's the only load it needs to oppose. Um, should we then just take two and three as, as one section and not, not worry about it? Different areas. Different areas. Different areas mean different responses to those loads. That's one of the things we've been looking at as we go along. And then obviously, again, this has got to be 900 kilonewtons. All right, so we can use the, uh, the business we've done before. Remember, we're looking for del L. That's going to be the sum of the individual dels 
for each of the four sections. Actually, only each of the three sections, because for this intermediate, incomplete solution, this bottom section four is unloaded. So we can find this then for each of the three loaded sections. And we'll take them all to be the same material. So figure that out real quick. Remember each of these sections is 150 milliliters, uh, millimeters, 150 millimeters. Um, and uh, leave it in terms of E, because I'm not going to tell you yet what the material is. Just that it's all one material is. That's all I'll tell you for now. So when you do this, you should have some number over here. So I need that, that sum number. this weekend? Stay up and party? It's a community college. We don't have fraternities, so we can't go out being stupid. You have to go out and be stupid on your own. You work. Gosh, how many stewards did you pass on the way in? You could have gotten a nice cup of coffee. Yeah, it's not difficult. Just kind of you make the turn in. Some of the places, I know Cumberland's Farms, I think they even have super jolt coffee now, super high calf. Nice. Yeah, you've got to drink it within a few a certain amount of time, otherwise it'll burn through your mug out here. So get it in your stomach, let it burn through that first. restraint is lifted, a solution we can do, then we'll superimpose it over a solution with the reactions put back in. And we're all doing the same problem, so when you get something, check it. Watch your units. We've got kilonewtons, millimeters, and millimeters squared. All mixed in there. Total units, of course, should come out to be something like meters, since this is a distance that we're looking for. It's the amount of deformation of the material itself. Not what I got. Let's see. Double, double check your numbers. Watch your yeah. 
your powers of the powers that be. I'm being kind of mysterious by not telling you what the material is, so there's no value for E yet. So just uh, all of this will accumulate to some number over E and should have units, nope, not bite. Should have units of meters all told together, including the units of pascals or megapascals on the bottom. Got something on? Yeah. And right digits. Pat, got anything? Yeah. Almost. We got each of the P's. Got all the P's, the L's, and the A's. Make sure you get the right ones for the right spots. Can you remind us how to convert the area? I know you like square or something. Yeah, we have area. Uh, I think one of them was 400 square millimeters. So, uh, you've got millimeters on the bottom, meters on the top, but we're trying to convert square millimeters, not millimeters, so we need to square the unit for the conversion factor as well. Then we could cancel the millimeters squared over millimeters squared and are left with meters squared. I think that was what a, a uh, three and four was the big one. That help, Pat? Yes, thank you. Of course. DBA, did you did you get your units or your? Uh, You guys have to get it. I don't have any room on the board to do it. I'm stranded. Throw it up on the screen. Um, easy. One of the easiest things to do is get them into base units as you go. For example, uh, P1 would be 900,000 newt. So you make the conversion like that on the fly. L1 is 150 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. We had it in millimeters. A, we can make the conversion there. That's going to be what? 400 times 10 to the minus 6. Because we have 10 to the minus 3 squared on the bottom. So just put that in, uh, that was 250 though, not 400. Just put it in like that. So we have newtons per square meter. E will be in newtons per square meter, but it's on the bottom, so those will cancel, leaving just meter. So there's the, there's the first of the factors with with I equal to one. All our lengths and our cross section areas come just from the little piece that we cut through. We don't look at the rest of it. No, the the length is the length of each section. This this force, for example, P one, where we made some imaginary cut somewhere through one here, that imaginary cut could come anywhere in that section. So that whole section one has a load of 900 kilonewtons in tension. Its length is 150 millimeters, and its area was the 250 millimeter squared. Oh. 
if that's why I numbered these sections this way because nothing changes in this first 150 millimeters. Nothing changes in the second one. There's a change between the two, but once we're in this section, it's all the same all the way down. Then we get an area change, then we get a load change. No, Jake? Go by that? No, no, I was just going, I was going from the bottom to the top. Alright, well, yeah, that doesn't matter. I know, but like when I have like sections four and three, I figure I'd take the whole length from three to four. No, there's no load on section four. So don't you just ignore the length. Yeah. Remember when we we were looking at the the uh, the strain originally, it's over the original length, but it's the loaded length. There's no load on this sec this bottom section. Why should it deform? So what? Cut it off and there's no difference. We cut it off and throw it away and there'd be no difference in terms of the results. The load is up here. Down here, there's no load. There's not going to be any elongation. This doesn't come into it at all. So if that was running all the way through, it would take the whole length. If this load was down here, yeah. But that would have made this little drawing here different. In fact, then we would have had just one section three to four. Anytime there's a change in area or a change in load, I change my section count. Now what do you get, Frank? Oh. Yeah, that's there. That's the number. You got good desk or good uh, powers on it now? Yeah, that looks good. What do you got, Colin? Uh, no, it should be over E. Over E's e on the bottom there. So section two, this should become 600. The length stays the same, the area stays the same. Section three, the load stays at the 602 had. The length stays the same, but now the area goes up to 400. And then section four, we don't have to do it all. Because it's unloaded. Pat, what do you have? Oh, I'm not doing it now. Got something better? Uh, check check with DJ, he's got it. Check with TJ, he's got it. Something better. Looks like all your units. You can cancel some of the units out. We got 10 to the third here and 10 to the minus third there. That'll help a little bit. Did anybody get some help from you? Got it now? Yeah. Okay. Make sure the units work on one of them, but then be careful you get the right numbers in the right place later.
times 10 to the ninth. If you didn't get that number, it's got to be just a matter of uh, calculator error or something. As long as you wrote each of the pieces down in the right place, be careful. It's really easy to get going too fast here and uh, overwrite some of this stuff. All right, so Tubi, you got it. Colin, you're okay. Need you. Jake, yeah. Got that? Yeah. yeah. What, what, now that I wrote it down, you got it? TJ, you got it. Pat, yeah. got it. Frank, you okay? Finally got it? Bobby? Okay. So that's the number we need. Because remember, it's that number that we need to uh, recover with the second part of the solution. Now we take off those two loads, find out what force would be required to push the piece back to its original length, to recover that. That's meters. Now we need to do this business here that we've already we've already done that type of problem. trying to do now is find what force would be required to push that back by that much. Well, maybe easier said than done. How do we do that? We do it in the same way. Again, break it into two sections where the area doesn't change and no load is added or subtracted and that simply breaks it into two sections then and we're looking for whatever change there is in those two sections is equal to the del r that we're trying to recover which we already know because it's got to be equal uh, and opposite to del l Again, just leave it in terms of E. You need to come up with what P2 are, uh, sorry, P1 and P2 are, and then add them together. This should be a function of RB. When we set that equal to this, we can solve for RB then. So, L1, A1, L2, L2, A2, pretty straightforward, I hope. But what's P1 and P2? Remember, we're doing a different solution. It's not the same P1 and P2 that we had with this solution. We're now adding the second 
part to it. But L1, A1, L2, A2, they're known. You need to come up with P1 and P2, put those in there, add them together. We'll have over here a function of E. Remember, I haven't told you what that is. And some function of RB. So you need to come up with, again, just that number that goes up there. First thing to come up with is what's P1 and P2 that go in there. There'll be functions of RB, what we're trying to find, or you know, the reaction because of the immovable support at the bottom. Notice in this drawing, I do not have these loads. It's simply what load is required, what reaction is required to recover what those loads originally caused. This is unloaded other than this reaction. different index numbers than we had over here. So we have a different problem we're doing now, but we're going to add the two of them together. If we kept those loads on and added it to here, then we have twice those loads. Got something to me? Now you're now you're anti-jacasizing, not thinking about it enough. L1, A1, L2, A2, they're right off the picture. What are P1 and P2? for this particular problem. What? RB. They're RB. RB is the only load on there, so internally that's going to be the only load on either one of the sections. So RB equals P1 equals P2. We don't know what that is yet, but that's why this is going to be, this answer is going to be a function of RB because then we can solve for it. So again, all you need for me is that number that's up there. Just to be technical, uh, we want a minus on there because we do know it's going to be a contraction. Otherwise, we're, we're too many minus on. Bob, okay. What's missing? You got the numbers here. Just P1 is RB, P2 is RB. We don't know what that is yet. 
So the second number is going to be a function of RB over E. I need whatever number's left there. Got it? Uh, I think that's it. Yeah. Oh, wait, let me see. You have one. No, I have, you, you have an extra power of 10 from what I have. Okay, that's the number I had. A couple people are coming up with it. A one. Yeah? Oh, it's so exciting. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. Nine. So exciting. I feel like, like a, an American Idol where they drag out the announcement so they can play, play a poignant music. 1950, minus 1950. What? That's uh, nothing more than L1, A1, L2, A2. So now we can say 1.125 times 10 to the 9th over E equals, let's see, uh, oh, I had a minus in here, so I have a minus, a minus. Oh no, we'll have minus on there, so. Uh, notice. What's that tell you? No, no, that's, I mean, that's the mechanics of what you need. What does this tell you in terms of you being uh, an engineer on this project? It doesn't matter what the material is. The reaction is going to be the same when we have a problem. I don't even have it up there anymore. Between two rigid, rigid supports, any material is going to react in the same way in this problem. So now you can solve for R B and. You can solve for RA, whatever the reaction was at the top as well. So do that and we're done. Okay, that's RB. Where's RA? Got uh, two reactions, one at each place now. going to be on the order of somewhere around zero to a thousand kilonewtons probably because that's all the loads are. So if you're getting anything way out of that. Take a, take a 
expectation. Write down less numbers. Colin got something? Well, let's start with RB, because if you don't have RB, no point in getting RA. You agree? So it does not point through this. TJ's got the same. Yeah. TJ's got the same. Frank's got the same. 577 And then you can do a free body on the whole piece. And find out what the reaction is at the other end. sum to zero. So you can find RA. What's it mean that RA is up? And that's a different type of attachment. If RA was down, you could just set the strut against the immovable support and that's all you'd need. But in this case, RA needs to pull on the piece, so you might have to thread it in or bolt it in or weld it. What if, what if that immovable support wasn't there and everything else was the same? What would the piece do? Yeah, but to form how? Uh, press. Yeah. Because there's more load going down, it would shrink. So the purpose of far, for piece RA is to hold it up there. Which uh, I guess is kind of how you'd expect it. If this was a roof, and this was a basement, and then this was some intermediate floor, I guess it'd be the, the two spots there. Okay. Sorry? Would it have come out the same if we had the other way? Like turn it upside down? I mean, take away this support and leave that one? Take away this one and leave the one down here? Yeah. Or if we had. Yeah, shoot. Like going down instead? Like if we flip over completely? Well. If we did, if we had RB down, then it wouldn't make any. We'd have a negative sign in here. Just yeah, so you'd have to like, if we had it completely upside down, turn it the other then it'd be like everything to be packed inside. Yeah. So these forces would be up. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, it'd be. I mean, yeah, you have to turn all of it over or none of it. 